you know, uh, John Larson and I came into the Congress together, elected in 1998 um, to be here. But I want you to know, John, that I have been working on issues of Social Security since the 1970s, well before I was eligible for Social Security. When I was an organizer in Chicago, my first, um, one of my first organizing efforts was to help establish um, Metro Seniors in Action, an organization in the city of Chicago of older Americans. I'll tell you what, John, I learned a lot from them. One of them was courage to stand up to power to not be afraid of the old Mayor Daley in Chicago, not to be afraid of uh, anyone, um, to stand up for rights. And, um, and one of those uh, priorities then as well was making sure that Social Security was, was solid. Um, I, uh, I also um, was, uh, now you talked about the Alliance for Retired Americans, I was the uh, executive director of the chapter of that in the state of Illinois for um, throughout throughout most of the uh, the the eighties until I ran for the the legislature in 1990 um, and again we were fighting I remember well to protect social security well guess what now. We're not just talking about protecting Social Security, but we did have a battle when George W. Bush decided that he thought privatizing Social Security was a good idea. Well, all over the country, we organized, seniors organized, the Democrats organized to make sure that privatizing Social Security, which would have jeopardized the security of that um, benefit, um, and, and, and actually, let me correct that for a minute. You know, we call, many people call Social Security an entitlement. You know, this is something that people in every paycheck that they have had is paid for. This is a, uh, a, a program that is pay, paid for out of the pocket of workers and has to be there when they retire. This is not some sort of a gift from the American people. This is something that has been earned by the American people. But we won that battle with George W. Bush um, because that was not the, uh, the direction that the majority of Americans, Democrats, Republicans, uh, rural, urban wanted. They wanted to make sure that Social Security was reliably there. Um, but anyway, it was always to protect Social Security and now, thank you, John Larson, because now we are talking about improving Social Security benefits and isn't it about time? Right now, the majority of Americans pay, uh, get more than half of their income from Social Security. You know, and when it was first, uh, when, when Franklin D. Roosevelt first talked about Social Security, it was thought of as a three-legged uh, uh, three three stool. Did you talk about that already? Okay, so the first was people's savings. You know what? There's hardly any savings anymore for the elderly. Um, and actually, for most Americans, hardly have any money, unfortunately, that's, that's been put away because average wages compared to the wealthiest people has gone down. The second was pensions. Remember that? There were pensions. People would have that guaranteed retirement benefit from their work. Those are largely gone. And then Social Security to help along. Well, now it is mostly about Social Security. More than half of Americans rely on Social Security for more than half of their income. And, um, and a quarter of seniors now rely on Social Security for 90% or more of their income. 
You need Social Security to survive. But let's talk about what survival is. The average monthly Social Security check is $1,543 per month. Who can live on that? I mean, it's really a struggle at the very best to be able to even make it. That's it. $1,543 a, a month. So your legislation is so incredibly important. And you talked about grandparents. Well, you know, plenty of us in the Congress now are also Social Security eligible, and those who are not are thinking about their parents and, and loved ones. But I also want to point out that two of my grandchildren benefited from Social Security because, sadly, their mother had died. And so they were eligible for benefits that helped them to be able to um, continue with their education. So it is a family plan. Social Security is a necessity. But for a long time, we've also been talking about women, particularly women, people who have left the workforce who, to become caregivers, but there's been no help for them even though they haven't been able to pay into Social Security. And I now uh, understand that there will be uh, a provision for a caregiver credit. Huge, thank you so much, for people who have taken time out of the workplace. Many of us have heard from public employees, including school teachers, who have lost Social Security benefits due to the so-called windfall elimination um, provision that has meant unfairly that they have lost Social Security benefits. Finally, after years and years and years of fighting, that unfairness will be gone because of your legislation. Yield? Yes. It's gone, and let me say that this has been bipartisan. Chairman Neal, a Social Security recipient himself, he lost his father, he lost his mother. His grandmother was then raising him, and he lost his grandmother. Tom Reed, the ranking member on Social Security Subcommittee, and Tom Rice, both lost parents and were raised on Social Security as well. Uh, Mr. Davis, uh, has put a bill in and had sponsored a bill for a number of years to eliminate the windfall elimination provision. But finally, President Biden said, we're going to repeal this in its entirety. And so it shows that there is an ability, a bridge to come together. And so many of these things, including caregiver opportunities, are bipartisanly sponsored within this bill and included as part of the bill. We've yet to have anyone endorse and support the bill, but that's a matter, I think, of voting and getting beyond uh, the what happens in this chamber and in discussions between here and the Senate is that there's an awful lot of talk about helping veterans but nobody actually votes one way or the other. There's an awful lot of talk about understanding what we have to do, but then nobody votes. The time for reckoning, and this is a point President Biden makes, Jan, all the time. And I know, Madam Speaker, you understand this as well. Our very democracy and our republic is at stake here because is government in an entrepreneurial capitalistic system like ours where there has to be, by the nature of the system, risk that is taken. Well, that's important and good, but by the same token, what Roosevelt and subsequent presidents, including Eisenhower, including Nixon, and including Reagan, recognized is, yes, but we need that safety net there for people who work hard and play by the rules. And now President Biden has said, yes, this is a sacred trust. You know, Martin Luther King came to Washington, D.C. in 1963 during the famous march and gave us the phrase, the fierce 
urgency of now. He was talking at the time about segregation and about the need for voting rights. But the fierce urgency of now applies to all of our citizens, Jan, that you have addressed in your remarks who need this now, who are suffering, receiving below poverty level payments from their own government after they've paid in. And this at a time when we gave the nation's wealthiest 1%, 83% of a tax cut, God bless them. But you know what? It hasn't trickled down to everybody else. And that's why we have the system that we do to take care of. It's government's responsibility. And if a democracy is going to work, if we're not listening to what, as all the polls say, and we've accompanied more than six different polls talking about where the American people are, this is not partisan. This is totally bipartisan in terms of people's understanding what their needs are, their belief in a system they know that has never failed for them. Uh, President Biden, doc, Dr. Martin Luther King said, now is the time to make real the promise of democracy. Now is the time to make good on the promise of the federal government. That's what Joe Biden has said and what he so eloquently has called a sacred trust. Now is the time for us. This is beyond urgent, though it is the fierce urgency of now. It is shameful that this body the world looks in on this great nation, this great democracy that we have. It looks how we treat our people, how we treat our veterans, how we treat our children. The statistics that you rallied off about what's going on in this country and how they're depending on it, and then realizing that Congress hasn't done a thing thing in 50 years this is not anything that can be done and I repeat this again by executive order or by adjudication from the Supreme Court this is the responsibility of every man and woman in this chamber of 535 of us overall but it's our responsibility and the time to vote is long overdue. I yield back to the lady. Well, thank you. Let me, let me just close with this. You know, um, Congressman Larson, we're going to hear, oh, well, you know, too much money. We can't afford to increase the, the benefits. I think it's important to remind people, Social Security was born during the greatest depression that this country had ever seen. And it was from the understanding of the president of that time, President Roosevelt, who understood that we can't have poor houses for older Americans. That this country, if we can't afford to do that, then we don't, can't call ourselves a real democracy, a country that really cares for people. At this point, we are the richest country in the world, the richest country ever on the planet. And now is the time when we need to do this. There is absolutely no excuse. You've said about the urgency of now. This is a moment of opportunity. And we should not make the mistake of overlooking it. And so we've got everything in place. We've got your bill. We've got a president. And it is time now to engage everyone in this country to say yes. Let's make improvements to one of the greatest things that ever happened in the United States, the greatest treasures that we have, and that is Social Security.
Let's make it even better. And God bless you for leading the way on this. I am so proud to be um, helpful in any way that I can to be a partner with you. We can do this. We can do this. And I think Martin Luther King also coined a, a phrase as well. And he said in his remarks, and I'm paraphrasing here, but this is not the time for the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. This is not the time in the face of so much inequality and inequity. That's when problems happen in society, when the people see that their government has not lived up to its responsibility. As you noted, Jan, they pay into the system weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly. Our good colleague and friend John Lewis said, this is not only an important issue in terms of our people, this is a civil rights issue. And he said and believed that with every fiber in his being because what he saw as the people that were discriminated against were the low wage earners. And unfortunately, as you know and have spoken eloquently on, most of them are women and specifically women of color. And so to whether you had a job as a waitress or a seamstress, or whether you were one of those caregivers that everybody relies on, or whether because you had to go home to provide care for your family and you didn't pay into a system or your wage level long before pay equity was far lower than your male counterpart, this is not a reason you should live out your remaining days in poverty. And for five million, five million Americans, this happens. In a blink of an eye, we can do a tax cut. In a blink of an eye, we can pass a defense bill. And I support both. But I fervently support the fact that we have to take care of our citizens. And it's this body's responsibility. It is Congress's responsibility. And we cannot walk away. And every citizen in this country ought to make sure that they're holding their congressional delegations responsible for doing their job. This is nothing that should be kicked down the road again or put off to some gradual dealing with the subject matter or yet another study that we're going to try to look into this on. This is no, we don't need to study this. We know what the issue is here. We've looked in the mirror and the problem is the United States Congress. It is the body that votes and changes the policy and the direction. And with that, I thank the gentle lady for joining us. I